Is it an overstatement for me to say that most of us like new things? Now, how many of you are wearing something new you got for Christmas today? I am, a new belt, new socks. <laughs> how many of you have already returned something new you got for Christmas for something even newer and improved? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the marketing experts play into this attraction that we have for new things, and not just at Christmas time. This attraction to new things has even affected the church. Not long ago, I heard a talk by a hip young pastor who runs a big mega church back east saying that if you want your church to keep growing, you got to introduce new and improved programs and new and improved approaches. Now, I, for one, like new things in church. I like new styles of drama and art and new styles of multimedia. I happen to think that God kind of likes that, too. Think about the Christmas story. The high drama of an angel appearing to a virgin and her fiancé, and off they go tripping to have their baby in a little stable where they're visited by shepherds and magi. Talk about high drama. And that story has got multimedia coming out everywhere. You know, the whole sky is turned into a projection screen for a host of heavenly singers. Not even our media guru, Doug Peterson, has been able to pull that off. At least not yet. And so God, I think, loves new things, new ways of communicating new style of getting the message across. But it's hit me, and I am sometimes kind of concerned that our love for new things and new style can overshadow our concern about substance. In the Christmas story, with the drama and the flair, all of that served to point to the substance of that story, moving people to make a decision about that story in their lives. It's hit me with renewed force this Christmas season that the substance of the Christmas story and the substance of the Christian life is all about God at work doing new things in the world. It's about God doing something new in an old and broken world. And so as we pack up Christmas 2006, I'd like us to take a look, a new look, at God's new thing and to envision what that new thing might look like in our lives, in our church, and in our world. Our guide along the way is going to be a guy who was utterly convinced that the whole point of Jesus' coming was to usher in a new era of new things that would culminate in a new heaven and a new earth. Let's listen to the Apostle Paul as he spreads this great story before us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting with verse 14. Paul puts it, I think, with great style and substance. He says, for the love, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one has died for all and therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but should live for him who died for them and was raised again. So, from now on, we regard others from, we no longer regard others from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ that way, we regard him that way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself in Christ and has given us the ministry 
of reconciliation. That is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting our sins against us and giving to us this message of reconciliation. We, therefore, are Christ's ambassadors. God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For God made him who had no sin, to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Wow. Let's pray. Our awesomely creative God, we're here this morning, and we humbly and expectantly ask you to open up your word in a new way for us, that we might see you and see ourselves in a new way today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd say that the power center of this powerful passage is the simple sentence, verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is what? A new creation. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a what? New creation. Now Paul, in his original Greek language, puts this in a rather strange way. He actually leaves out the main subject and verb. So that literally it reads, if anyone is in Christ... New creation. It's as though Paul is struggling to paint the picture. That if we are in Christ, we we become part of, we are in a new creation. If we are in Christ, watch out. Because you have just stepped in to a river of new life. That is surging through the world, refreshing, renewing, remaking all things. This powerful point was laid out with great style and substance in a new book by N.T. Wright. It's called Simply Christian. Why Christianity makes sense. It's the best book I've read this year. Because it pictures this story of new creation. He says that the heart and soul of being a Christian is not uttering certain words, like, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Wright says that's part of it, but only the start of it. (laughs) Being a follower of Jesus means that we believe in certain things about him and that we plunge our lives into his life into the new creation launched by his life and death and resurrection. Wright says that if I am truly in Christ, then Christ is at work in me, and I am at work with him. Put simply, if I am authentically in Christ, then new things are in me, and I, am in to new things. If I am authentically a follower of Jesus, if you are authentically a follower of Jesus, then new things, my friend, are in you. What is in you that's so new and sensational? Well, something powerful and new entered the world that first Christmas morning. And something powerful and new enters everyone who says yes to Jesus. So what is this powerful and new thing that gets into us when we get into Jesus? Paul puts it so simply, with such style and such substance, in verse 14. He says, Christ's love compels us. What gets into us? It's a new love that gets into us. 
When we get into Christ, a new love rushes into our lives and it changes us. You know, sometimes I think we talk so casually about the love of Jesus for me and for you and for the world. Can we stop this morning and think about this love in a new way? It was a love that left the pleasures of heaven to be born in a dusty, drafty stable. It was a love that grew up to touch lepers and lunatics. It was a love that lifted up the status of children and women. It was a love that stood up against violence and racial prejudices. And it was a love that laid down its life in a horrific death. Paul was overwhelmed by this love. Verse 14, a love. It says that he died for all. Verse 18, he says, all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself in Christ. Verse 21, Paul says, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What gets into us? It's a love that reconciles us with God. How does that happen? While we were dead in our stubbornness and rebellion and silly insanities, while we were drifting farther and farther away from God, he came close to us and entered into our brokenness and took our brokenness upon himself. He who knew no sin became sin for us. The ugliness of our guilt, the stench of our guilt was placed upon Jesus and the beauty of his obedience now covers us. It's the only way we can be reconciled to God is if we in our tainted personalities can be covered by the untainted personality of Jesus. That's the only way we can possibly live in the presence of an untainted God. Paul was overwhelmed by such a love that would go to such a length to reconcile us to our Creator. When we are reconciled to God, a love rushes in that changes us. You know it. True love does change us, doesn't it? True love changes things. In fact, Paul said, in verse 14, he says, he is convinced. He says the love of Christ compels us. Christ's love for us compels us. That verb compels is also translated, it constrains us, it governs us, it hems us in. True love does that, doesn't it? True human love changes us. Because I truly love my wife, Judy, I relate to other women in a different way. And because I truly love my kids and grandkids, it changes the way I spend my time and my money. I can tell you that. <laughs> In fact, when our first grandson was born, I thought we'd have to take out a second mortgage on our home just to fund all the stuff my wife wanted to get for him. True love changes us. It's true of human love. And it's even more true of divine love. The love of Christ, his love for us, changes us. It changes the way we relate to others. It changes the way we spend our time and our money. This was Paul's point in verse 15. He says that Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one has died for all. He has died for all so that we who live should no longer live for ourselves, but should live for him who died for us and was raised again. This love that comes in pushes out old, outmoded, outdated priorities 
In fact, when he says the old has passed away, the Greek word that is there is archaea. The archaic things that no longer fit into the new creation in Christ. The old attitudes, the old opinions, the old priorities, the old consumption habits, the old approaches, the old way we feel about ourselves, the old way we treat others, those old things that no longer fit into the new creation are pushed out by this new love that comes in. And we become new creations in Christ. It changes the way we run our lives. That certainly has been the case for one of San Diego's most celebrated citizens of late. You probably heard about him. Some of us think that maybe the Chargers have a shot at the Super Bowl this year. And if we make it, it will probably be due to one person more than any other who's known by his initials, which are what? T. Ladanian Tomlinson. He joined the Chargers six years ago, having graduated from Texas Christian University. Grew up in Waco, Texas. A single mother who scrimped and saved, worked two jobs so that her son's dreams of playing football might come true. And so what did LT do five years ago, six years ago, when he got his first five-year contract for $38 million? What was the first thing he did with that wad of cash? He bought a house, a new house for his mother, and one for his sister, and a building for his mother's fledgling new business. Oh, and then he also got a condo for himself in San Diego. Something new is in this young man. The recent issue of Sportsman of the Year magazine picked it up, and it was declared LT the Sportsman of the Year. In fact, the first paragraph in this article has it this way. His teammates idolize him. He respects his profession. He cares about his community. And oh yeah, he's a touchdown-making machine. <laughs> he's been with the Chargers six years, and he's been running over records right and left. Just in the last month, he's, he broke the record, the NFL record, of points scored in a season and touchdowns scored in a season. Athlete of the Year, says Sportsman's Magazine. The Union Tribune, in fact, his wife, they have an interview with his wife, Latorsha is her name, and she says this about her husband. She says, I, it's hard for me to understand how someone who is so blessed with all this talent can be so humble and simple and not the least bit cocky. Sometimes I wonder if he even knows he's Ladanian Tomlinson. And then two year, weeks ago, there was a front page sports section article about him in the Union Tribune. And it placed him, his picture, alongside pictures of Mother Teresa and Mahatma Gandhi. <laughs> rising to such echelons of esteem. And the article tells about how on his one day off a week, he gets up early and goes to children's hospital to rub shoulders with the kids there and their families. And how he and Latorsha have started a foundation that has already scholarship dozens of kids from the inner city, San Diego, into college. And how he and she fed 8,000 people this last Thanksgiving in Waco and San Diego. Now, what is it that makes this guy tick? I went on the web. One website had the reason, had his personal testimony. And this is what LT says to explain himself. He says, my mom told me a long time ago that God would take me to places I had never dreamed if I kept him first and gave him all the glory. I believe that with all my might. I make sure I always give him all the glory and praise because I know that in one second, in one game, in one play, it could all be over. <laughs> So I'm just here right now having success, but at the same time, I know it's all because of him. As long as you believe in him, no matter what happens in your life, understand that it's all for a purpose. Try to understand what God wants you to do in this lifetime. Once you find that out, your life will be more clear 
and you will understand exactly what you need to do to be a true success. From the mouth of the 29-year-old young man who has something new inside of him, which is the new creation of Christ. If we are truly in Christ, new things will be in you and in me, and it will change us. It will change us for the good and for good. We will no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for us and rose again for us. If we are authentically in Christ, then new things will be in us. This year, we will be gaining new insights about the one who died for us. This year, we will see, him, we will see ourselves surrendering more and more of the old life to him and receiving more and more of the new life from him. More and more, little by little, day by day, year after year, we become the new creation in Christ Jesus. If anyone is in Christ, new things are in you, and you are in new things. When we are reconciled in Christ, we then become reconcilers with Christ. Paul says in verse 18, all of this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself in Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Dear friends, when we place ourselves in Christ, into this river of new life, he will take us out into the world as part of the new creation, as agents of the new creation. Verse 19, God was reconciling not just us. God was reconciling the world. Paul's word here is the word cosmos. Christ works his new creation in us. And at the same time, we work with him to bring this new creation to all the cosmos. We are agents of renewal for the whole creation where there has been brokenness and violence and disintegration. We become agents of new creation. You and I, young and old, have a mission. It's God's mission, whereby he is putting to right all that's wrong in our lives, in our families, in our neighborhoods, in the environment, and in the world. N.T. Wright puts it so well with style and substance in his new book, Simply Christian. He says the Bible story is so hope-filled, so compelling, so inviting because it is the story about a God who is at work to make things new in the world, to mend lives, to mend families, to mend neighborhoods, to mend people groups, to mend the environment. It's about a God who is at work to restore all that's been damaged and defaced by human stubbornness and rebellion. And so Wright says that being a Christian is not so much about believing certain things so that I can get to heaven. Why? Because Wright says that heaven is overlapping earth right now. One of Jesus' favorite teaching topics was about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Jesus says when he was restoring and renewing people and creation, he says that the kingdom of God is among you. It's coming near. We pray it, don't we? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. When Jesus is at work in us, through us, his kingdom is coming close and heaven is coming to earth. If we are in Christ... We are reconciled to God, and that reconciling love propels us out into the world as agents of new creation and reconciliation. 
We will give ourselves wholeheartedly to ministries where God's kingdom, his new creation, is coming to life, mending people, mending families, mending communities, mending the environment. We give ourselves wholeheartedly to those new creation initiatives. After painting this glowing picture of God's new creation and our part in it, Paul gets personal. He looks his Corinthian friends right in the eye and he says to them, verse 19, or verse 20, he says, We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Which leads me, dear friends, to ask, who are you? And what are you into? Who are you and what are you into? Are you authentically reconciled in Christ and a reconciler with Christ in our world? To be a Christian, means that new things are in you. It means you are letting that love of Jesus loose in your life to change your life and loose in your world to change your world to become more and more like that promised new creation. That love will displace old things, old prejudices, old habits, old addictions, old pleasures, with things of the new creation, you will become a new creation in Christ. More and more, day by day, this year, more than last year. So on the edge of this new year, may I ask you, are you ready? Are you willing to say to Jesus, Lord of new creation, do your new thing in me this new year? And if we are authentically Christians, it means that we are into new things. It means that we are willing to join Jesus in writing this story of new creation in the world around us. And so I would ask you, dear friend, are you ready and willing to say to Jesus, oh Lord of new creation, use me in a new way this year to bring new life to my family, to my neighborhood, to my community, to the world. In this new year, what will the new you be like? And what will the new you be doing so that his kingdom will come more fully and his will be done more fully on earth as is being done fully in heaven? Can we pray together? Dear one, beloved of God, if you've never taken a step into this river of life, if you're sitting on the sidelines looking, wondering, thinking, maybe this is the day to jump in. You can never be a swimmer by simply looking at the pool and believing in the water. You've got to dive in and learn to swim. Dear friend, is this the day on the edge of the new year when you will say yes to Jesus and place your life in his new life, in his new creation? If it is, you can utter a simple prayer, Lord Jesus, come into my life as I come into your life. That prayer will make you a new creation. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for being with us today in a new way. And I pray that if someone has uttered this prayer, these simple words of commitment to you, thank you, Lord, that you're already beginning to make them, him or her, a new creation. And Father, for those of us who have been in this river of life a while, we want to be further in, further on. Show us this year new things that you would have us be and do for you as we live and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.